Hey everybody, it's Dave. Before we get into it today, I wanted to uh, just do some business real quick. I want to thank everybody who's listened so far. Uh, the response has been great. We've been very happy with it. And if you would go on to iTunes and rate and review us, that would be incredibly helpful. Um, that would be a way that we can uh, get a little more interest in the show, get it out to more people. And uh, we're going to keep going with this thing. I've got a lot more interviews lined up and I'm going to keep the schedule up. So uh, if you wanted to help us out that way, that would be excellent. Also, follow us on Twitter at Nosy Nobody. The Twitter account isn't just going to be uh, for this podcast. It's also going to be for other things off of nobodiesnose.com. So uh, do come check that out, please. And uh, okay, let's just get right into it here. Here we go. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of I've Known You Too Long. My guest today I am very excited about. This was someone I knew I had to have on the show, but she did not live in the area anymore, and I didn't know how I was going to make that happen. I didn't want it to go long before we got her in here. Luckily, she was in town visiting relatives, and so we're going to make this work. It might be shorter than what we normally do, but you know maybe that'll be better anyway. Um, my guest is Matisse Keshavez. And I may well have pronounced her name incorrectly. That may be the first thing we ask her. <laughs> um, I always knew Maddie's as Maddie. She was involved in the uh, Northwest Punk and Hardcore scene on the east side, the uh, Redmond Firehouse. We've talked about that on here quite a bit. She also did me the honor of starring in the lead female role in my film, The Edge of Quarrel. So I'm just going to go ahead and welcome her in right now. Woohoo! <laughs> Hello, Maddie. Catherine Dave Larson. <laughs> let's go. Before I even do my starting question, let's talk about the name. Is it okay <laughs> that I call you Maddie? You can. Yeah, you've known me long enough. All right, but that's... 20 see, years but you, you but, but you don't like it. I do kind of cringe at this point in my life, but it's all right. No, I'll, go, I'll do it right. But the problem that I have is that a guy like me, 40-something-year-old white guy, mildly <laughs> educated at best, <laughs> public school, uh, you know... Break the mold, Larson. How can I make it sound Here it comes. right? And I really, really hope that the entire Seattle hardcore scene is listening right now. Okay. Because it's Mahdis Keshavars, which sounds like ketchup jars. Oh, you never told me that before. I only one Jim Martin, who you may also recall, really did me the honor of telling me that he remembered my last name because it sounds like ketchup jars, and I use it to this day. Okay. Mahdis. Yes. Now, my problem is, is I just, I, I cringe at trying to make it sound like I'm affecting an accent I don't have. But I also feel like if I say it any other way, it sounds like I'm being like, mad D. Like, you know, no, like all of a like sudden that. I have that accent, that, that 20 miles out of any city accent that David Cross talks about. I'm giving you an A for effort. So Mahdi. <laughs> Mahdi. Yep. If Maddie falls out, fine. But <laughs> Mahdi is preferred. Um, and then Keshavars. Yep. See what Ketchup Jars does? Ketchup it totally jars. gets you there. Well, the thing is, I remember... I mean, when, when we were doing the movie, you definitely talked to me about how to correctly pronounce the name. Right. And it, the, the R is the only part that I've really had a problem with because it just gets more Vez. And yeah. then it's like, well, that's not right either. But look, with the jars, you're there. Ketchup jars. Yep. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Maddie. Yes, sir. Matisse. Yep. I've known you too long. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I'm afraid about what's about to come <laughs> as I realize just how long you've known me. No, don't be afraid. But I've known you so long. Okay. What what I've been saying is I've, I've known you so long that uh, I don't remember when we met. That's been the common one with people. But with you, I feel like it's more, I've known you so long that it's just a shame that I've, we've been so out of contact for the last yeah. about 15 years. You, you left shortly after the edge of coral was done and went on to, Bigger and better things than a lot of people, you know, from this Aww. scene have done. Interesting things, certainly. Um, and it's just, you know, it's been, you've been a real mover and shaker. And so I've missed you. I've missed you as well. Oh, thank you so and much. And we may be far apart, but I don't think we ever were not in love. Oh, <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> I'm going to bring the heart sappy stuff to the show, Dave. Oh, please. That's so great. <laughs> um, what uh, was it, what we do on the show? is we talk about when we met. Mm -hmm. We figure out if we can figure out the exact moment mm -hmm. where we were, oh and then we go back from there, uh -huh. and I try to figure out how it was, who you are, where you came from, and how it was that you came to be in a place where we would have met. Okay. And then we go forward and we talk about stuff that we remember, 
and what you're doing now. All right. And that's it. That's the format. I'm excited. Where'd we meet? I don't remember. Old Firehouse. I, I don't think it was the Old Firehouse, Dave. I, I think that we met somewhere like the Velvet Elvis or some house show situation. Like it, it might have even been the Goat no. House. Oh. Because I, I don't think that the Old Firehouse got fully like established. I think I knew you before it became fully established. Shows at the Bellevue Y? Possibly. Would you have been sitting, taking tickets or doing anything at the no, door? No, I would have been. I think I like was in line for the Fugazi shows and things, which I'm sure you were there as well. <laughs> no, absolutely. And it, with you, it seems like right about the time I became aware of Lex and Kate Becker right. and c that crew out mm -hmm. there, you you were part of that there. and you were there. It's possible. I mean, I, I have the distinct memory and I feel like I see you. I see your awesome haircut, which was fundamentally different than what your hair is right now. And the funny thing is, though, just before you met me, it was the same as this. Really? Yeah. It was short when I met you, right? It was very short. It was super clean cut. I have long hair now, but when I moved to Seattle, I had long hair and then I cut it off right after I got here. And that would yes. have been 90, end of 92. Yes. Yeah, so right about I, the time things were is, happening out there. Right. Which is also, I mean, I graduated high school in 94. And so I don't think, I mean, the old firehouse was going. So maybe it was the old firehouse. It's possible. Yeah. And I think. And I remember I you always wore a black t-shirt for your label <laughs> and black pants and black Converse. Yeah, and you we were almost exclusively black. Anybody surprised? <laughs> you have, you have a you have an image of 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 the clothing that I wore at the time. I remember like that. I I have this distinct memory of seeing you, and you're always being kind because you know it's a very male dominated scene, and I'm sure that that will be like a thread that we discuss tonight. <laughs> cool. But it was super man, you know, and so I always felt like I had to assert myself, assert myself a certain way. And I remember you always used to be there, and you're always super friendly. And super encouraging in a way for me and others to do stuff, like just do something. This is the scene, like you got to be punk, you got to be straight edge, it doesn't matter, just got to do something. This is it. The revolution's around the corner. And I was like, yeah, I got to take this dude seriously. And you always had flyers, which I felt we really shared this because I also always had a flyer. I was always promoting something and you always had something in your hands. You were never at a show Without oh. something in your hands. Uh, excursion records stuff. Always excursion Ads stuff. Ads for the label you, or... Something. Yeah. You always had worked on some project. And I'm sure oh. you've talked about this on the other episodes, but your Kinko's hookup was legendary. I mean, if <laughs> Kinko's was still around and functioning, they would come for you after these shows of confessions. <laughs> like, how it's much? It's funny how much Kinko's plays into... And that, I think, is how we met. Kinko's? I think that you were working at Kinko's. Bellevue? And no, on Capitol Hill. Oh. And you were, I, I want to say like, later. no, yeah, maybe. But you hooked it up for me at Kinko's <clears throat> a bunch of times. <laughs> hooked it up, I meaning mean, I did a great job. Excellent, excellent corporate and charged representative. charged correctly. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for my clicker. <laughs> Are you sure you're not mixing me up with like Wally? Maybe it was Wally. <laughs> Call him Wally. <laughs> All right. Um. No, it was it was a little earlier than when I would have been at the because uh, that was I was working just like one day a week at that at that Capitol Hill Kinko's and Carrie Whitney would be in there. Yeah, Carrie um, Whitney. But I met Carrie Whitney through you. Sure, but you already knew me, right? Carrie I Whitney knew you. Carrie Whitney basically appears in the beginning of the summer of 1994, and I think you. Yeah, no, we were friends before that. Right, and do you remember? This is a this is a great with Rocky. This ended up mm -hmm. being his very first show. So this was kind of a fun thing at the old firehouse. <laughs> careful with that. <laughs> at the old firehouse, there was a show in 93. It was probably spring of 93. Mm -hmm. It was seaweed, undertow and peeved. Mm -hmm. And it was huge. Yeah, it was I probably the first well. time there was a big like maybe 600 plus whatever yeah. show at the old firehouse. I totally remember that. that show was kind of a. a that was, show was a really big deal. It's Rocky Votolato's first show. Ever? Uh, maybe first show ever. Wow. And that wasn't a concert. Right. Um, and we knew each other. You were well into the, the we old firehouse pals. at that point, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'm really- I helped start the old firehouse. Like Right. Okay, and so- and that and that's right after that Fugazi show, yeah. isn't it? Remember, there was the one 1007 show where they threw all the, all the uh, tortillas and everything, yeah. too? And that was what? Was that maybe one of the very last Bellevue Y shows? Before the firehouse was so. really going? I think so. Because with the Bellevue Y, like, I, you remember, I grew up in an Iranian household, so I did have to, like, 
beg and plead to go to any show at that point because I wasn't fully employed by the city of Redmond, which gave me the legitimacy to tell my parents I was working. So to say like, well, oh, I want to go to a show. I so want to talk about this <laughs> stuff. Oh, you have no idea. <laughs> like, so I, I had to like lie, cheat and steal like effectively to kind of convince my parents to let me go to shows. And that's why I started doing shows because my parents would be like, one, okay. it's work. But the second part was you and um, Keon Maymand, may he rest in peace, were the first to tell me like I should start doing my own thing and promoting my own shows. And that's when I was like, oh, I could start doing that like I didn't know. And so I think with the seaweed show, that was one of the first ones I remember like fully being involved and helping Kate and like doing all those things. And you I think you even you're the one that introduced me to Aaron. Where is he now? Aaron from seaweed. Oh. oh yeah he's around yeah, yeah see what like, okay all right so that would have been probably at that show I, yeah look it's yeah. So, okay so so we won't spend too much time on it it's old firehouse it's as soon as i'm coming through the door if you're working anything there i'm probably yeah. saying like hey i need to sell merch and I, I need to be able to take pictures up front in front of the barrier and and i'm talking to you i'm talking to yeah. kate yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's where we meet. Mm -hmm. um, you also always <clears throat> hand me a stand, a pack of whatever flyer or whatever you're pushing. So I would also be handing those out. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. So that's where we become friends. Mm -hmm. And you were, I mean, what I do know about you is that you were immediately someone who was just a mover and a shaker, Aww. like had a great attitude and just someone that I was like, ah, oh, ally. Immediate. Thank you. Immediate sense of, of being an ally. Thank you. Well, it's true. I'm not lying. I'm not, I, I don't need it. to lie. I know, but you, like I said, it's a male dominated scene. It wasn't easy. <laughs> Still isn't easy. <laughs> so let's go back because we've got a lot of cool things that we can talk about that we did and were involved mm -hmm. in. But I want to know, just like what you just said, Iranian household, you're having to explain why you're going out to this place and doing this thing. But you have this job sort of and that mm -hmm. helps you. Um, where did you come from? <laughs> I come from Iran, <laughs> land of the brave. Were you born in Iran? I was. I was born in Iran. I was born in Iran, and then uh, there was a revolution in my country, uh, which was the result of many years of U.S. intervention. Oddly and enough, I, I'm old enough to remember this. I'm rather impressed. <laughs> and once that revolution hit, my family and many others decided to leave uh, temporarily in our minds because we wanted to kind of wait it out and see how things went so that we could go back home. And that wait ended up being a lifetime almost at this point. Um, How old were you when they left? Uh, almost four. Almost four. And what year was that? 1980. The revolution was in? 79. 79. So mm -hmm. it wasn't long. It wasn't long. Was the hostage crisis over when no, they it, left? or it, it was? I think it was the beginning okay. as we left. And so when we first came to America, we went to Oklahoma. Unfortunate for my family because no one sent us the memo <laughs> about what it meant to be Iranian and going to the South. Oh, what was the choice of, of, of going to Oklahoma? My, I had an uncle who lived there, I had okay. an uncle who was living there. So we thought, oh, we'll go and we'll stay with family. And I think we lasted about six months. You before. already had family in the U.S. at this point? I had point. one uncle Okay. who'd come to study years before. He'd already been in the U.S., I think, like six or seven years at that point. So okay. well before the revolution and all that stuff. So he had come to study. He was living in Oklahoma. We came out to stay with him. And I think we lasted about six months before we were like, oh, my God, we're in Oklahoma in the South. How many more times can we tell someone we're Mexican? Like, this sucks. And I so, just I listened to another podcast with yeah. another Persian person that said that they <laughs> faked being Mexican. Everyone, in high you had to fake it. You were not gonna live. Like as as it was, I had like I went to preschool and I got like I had racism. I got beaten. All this. Where did, where did you stuff. go to preschool? Oklahoma. Okay, so you remember being in Oklahoma. Well, you remember beatings. Like, oh, <laughs> those are things God. you remember. <laughs> like, I didn't get hit so much as a small child. A three or four year old doesn't, like, you know, that's not supposed to happen. But, like, you know. You've it, it been happened. beaten up? The the paddle they bring out. The paddle's oh. legal in Oklahoma. You know, oh, so, so, what, but, so they were paddling you just because you were... I laughed in class. I remember very distinctly. There was me and this boy, Richie, and Richie and I, he said something. I laughed, and I got in trouble, and he didn't. And they locked me in the bathroom, and they were like, I got the paddle, and then they were going to give me the paddle again, but they lock you in the bathroom. And as it luck turned out, I had a uh, one of the cooks or somebody in the who was working there, also probably posing as a Mexican, called my dad, who was Iranian. They were Iranian and they were, you know, whatever, called my dad secretly and said, listen, they've locked your daughter in the room, bathroom here. You better come get her. And I How like, old are you? I'm four. 
And one of my this earliest is this memories. isn't even great. So this is preschool. Yeah, it's it's like a Montessori or whatever it was, you know. And I was probably at Montessori wouldn't have. They locked a four year old alone in a bathroom. In the bathroom, and I knew that it was going to be my turn to get beaten again. So I was like petrifying fied sitting in the bathroom waiting, and the door opens, and there's my dad. Oh. And I was like, he's my hero to this day. Wow. Yeah. Welcome to America. Yeah. So you got the hell out of Oklahoma. Quit with a quickness. Which, and we went to the only natural place one would go after suffering through Norman, Oklahoma. Cheney, Washington. <laughs> okay. Clearly, my parents were not well versed in this <laughs> land. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just, like, why are we here <laughs> for six years? But they went to university <clears throat> there. We went there. We lived there for, I mean, until the fourth grade. And the fourth grade, we then came here and ended up in Kent and then went, <laughs> didn't last long in Kent and then ended up on the east side. Okay. Where all self-respecting Iranians go. <laughs> okay. Well, good. <laughs> so you came from Oklahoma. I don't know. Is, is Oklahoma the South? I guess it's. That's the. Yeah. Might as well be, right? Come on. <laughs> Haven't you seen the musical? <laughs> no. I, no. Oklahoma. You learned that in, in preschool? I went to the musical. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. But so you, you went to Eastern Washington. So you, might as, so you basically went to the South when. Of Washington. I did. Like, it's the same, almost the same thing, certainly now. It seems like you cross over the mountains from the I-5 corridor, and you're just in... No man's land. I took a trip over there recently in, oh. in a rental car. Wow. And uh, as soon as I got over, the, the, I was trying to find new radio stations, and I think I lost count at 13 different variations of Christian radio. Yeah. It was everything. It was like I think it was like a Christian ska station or something. It was yeah. crazy. So I'm like, yeah. oh, this is yeah. I know where it's these cr- these people's bread is buttered on on one side. Certainly. You want to hear more trauma <laughs> from my childhood? Yes. All, that, one of I don't want to miss any of it. Craziest things that happened to me as a child, and I swear I would. I had to go to therapy for this one. This <laughs> and and others, I'm sure. But this happened when I was in when we went went to Cheney. I went to the universities. My parents enrolled me in the university preschool, whatever it was, and I didn't speak English. I didn't learn to speak English till the fourth grade. Oh, roughly like like perfect English, right. maybe second grade. It wasn't fourth grade. It was maybe second grade. And um, when we went to the school, there was one girl, like my parents were also, except for my dad, learning to speak English and like, you know, we're adjusting, we're figuring it out. And uh, a young girl in the school came to me one day and she said, you know what tonight is? And I was like, I don't know. And I remember distinctly, we're on the swing, it was gonna, on, the, on the slide and it was going to be my turn to go. And I was like, no, what's tonight? And she says, tonight's the night that Jesus is coming down on his star and he is going to save everyone except you and your family because... You're Muslims and you're going to hell. I had no concept of Jesus, Muslim, not Muslim, Christian. I had no idea. But I went straight back to the classroom and puked all over the teacher. Oh. Petrified. That like this. And I remember coming home and like distinctly remember coming home, being really upset. My mom being like, what happened? Why'd you throw up? And me like putting my head on her shoulder and be like, mommy, tonight we're all going to die because this dude Jesus is coming for us. Oh, oh my God. Okay, so so <laughs> this was the first full message that you understand getting in English once you've learned the yeah, language. Yeah, once I learned my first English. They may have been saying it to you the whole time. It's possible. I mean, the teacher could have been saying it at that point, but like it only fully registered <clears throat> when young Brittany or whatever her name was, was like, tonight is the night. Jesus is coming for you. Oh, I, I enjoy laughing at painful, <laughs> you can horrible laugh. childhood stories. I'm telling you, stories. that's traumatic. Oh, yeah. But in, yeah. In it, oh, these things have a huge effect. Major. Yeah. And you ask why I'm in human rights. I didn't ask that. Yeah. But well, we'll I mean, talk one about, might ask yeah, I, 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 You're just jumping ahead. I'll I'm ask sorry. that for yeah, sure. We'll get that. Yeah. Oh, my God. Okay. So what's is that the most traumatic thing you remember happening in grade school? Yeah, except for this one other girl, Brooke, who got her head cracked open at recess. But that's a whole other thing. Okay. We pro- unfortunately, we have to move kind of fast that's today. Right. We've got about a half hour left. So, um, so junior high. Yes. Are you over? Are you still over there, Eastern Washington? When, when no. do you get? When do you get to I the moved, Seattle area? I moved area? to Seattle area fourth grade. Fourth grade. Fourth grade. Kent. Kent, and then quickly to Bellevue. Bellevue. Yeah. Okay, and Bellevue's better. Yeah, it's better. I mean, okay. it's traumatic, but it's better. And. Does your family have contact? I mean, is your family involved with what's going on in the Middle East and in Iran? Yeah, I mean, like, here's the thing. We moved to this country. If you know Iranian or world politics, whatever, certainly after the revolution in Iran, there became there was a war. The U.S. funded Iraqi Iraq, Saddam Hussein, to attack 
Iran. They did. It resulted in a long war, I think eight years. A million people died on both sides, including some of my family members. And so we didn't go back. Uh, and my childhood, in terms of up until I was maybe 12 years old, I guess, 13, 12 or 13 years old, my experience of going back to Iran really revolved around, um, you know, I, I wasn't able to go back. We only spoke on the phone to my family, and it oftentimes was you would hear bombs dropping in the background or the line would go dead. And so really it was not a, you know, my relationship was that I didn't grow up in a war zone, but I feel in many ways I grew up as a child of war, too. I never chose to come to this country. My parents weren't super excited about leaving their entire livelihoods and, have, you know, coming here. Right. We ended up here, and, you know, it's been good to us long term, but it was a tough one. Wow, I'm so sorry. Um, Are you apologizing for yourself or for your government right now? Um, <laughs> I am. A, yeah, I can't apologize for my sorry. government. And I didn't ever ever do anything personally. I, as a little kid, you have uh, been an ally yourself. I though. would have been. I would have been terrified. I would have been horrified with how other little kids yeah. were treating you, even when we were. Thank you, young Dave Larson. Like um, but no, just that the world is what it is. I mean, there's nothing. You, I there's what can I say? I'm yeah. sorry that. That's all right. But an, on one hand. Mm -hmm. I'm not sorry because you're not in my life without terrible trauma in the lives of millions See? of other people. There you go. And since this is Bright my side. story <laughs> and your story. I did. I want to tell you if this is like a bit of a non sequitur here. I think I remembered the first time we actually as friends hang out, hung out just the two of us. Oh, okay. And what is it? That was a time you invited me over because I was one of the only non fully vegan or vegetarian people. And once a year. Dave Larson fell off the wagon. No, no, not the straight edge wagon, but the vegetarian wagon. And you would go fishing and you would catch fish and you invited me over to your house on Capitol Hill because you were cooking fish that you made. Oh, my God. And you and didn't really that. know anybody else who would cook fish. And you were living with Ron Gardepe. Yeah. Ron remembers the fish for yeah. sure. Did and he so, eat with us too? No. Okay. He was vegetarian. He never, oh, he didn't okay. really exit the room. And we stayed <laughs> Oh, God, Dave, it's all coming back. <laughs> <laughs> you're jumping ahead, though. Okay. But I'm it's okay. Go. We'll go, when you're ready. <clears throat> That's what I'm talking And yeah. you got to understand, um, the whole vegetarian thing, I was never a – I always ate seafood. Oh. So I would only go fishing once a year because I'd go with my right. father. Uh-huh. So that was the once a year I had fish. But uh. I would still, you know, every once in a while – like when I would fall off the wagon is I'd go get a, a fish sandwich at Burger King and I wouldn't eat beef, pork, chicken, you know, any yeah. of the rest of it. Um. That's huh. funny. I yeah. didn't know. I remember putting the fish in the paper bag yeah. with the with uh, spices. It was and flour good fish. And stuff. I do oh. remember being pretty impressed. But, Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> that, it's crazy. I did yeah. not. Wow. I didn't know. So, yeah. okay. I'm gonna hold on to that because that's part of the the post meeting. Mm -hmm. um, we already knew each other. Obviously, I wouldn't yeah, have yeah, invited yeah. No, a stranger. No, no. We we're totally over. friends. No, we're totally <laughs> friends at that point. Okay. Uh, how do things change for you going into junior high? Junior high sucks I for hated everybody. It. Everybody, junior high is horrible. I hated it. Worst transition time forever. It's almost like you just lock kids up for that. It's truly, I think, one of the more miserable times of my life. Yes. I mean, I would never go back there. I don't think that I hated it. I okay. hated it. But you begin to meet people that I know and mm -hmm. people that will end up on this podcast in high mm -hmm. school. Yeah. And something changed in high school. Things had to have gotten better. They did. You know, I think that I reached this point where I ended up in high school. I resolved that I wasn't going to be popular. And I know I, this, I don't want to sound like an angry person because I'm totally not. If you know me, I'm really not an angry person. I definitely have viewpoints and things, but I think I'd resolve that I wasn't going to be super popular. And I had too many family restrictions to like become prom queen or even have those kinds of aspirations. Um, so I just resolved I was going to be super smart and I was going to get whatever I could out of this like situation that I was in. And I, I started like to just be like, I'm going to do whatever I want, you know, and I was really into political stuff. I was really into, you know, just alternative anything. I was reading Sassy magazine, and I really felt like it was, you know, groundbreaking or whatever. And someone started telling me about shows that were happening. And you kept hearing about it at the time. I mean, that was a really critical time in like sure. Seattle's history. And I would have said it would have maybe even started even a little earlier in the eighth grade. I went to school with a guy named Eric Freidenberg. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. Eric Friedenberg. Yeah. We used to ride the bus along with Jason Mesnick, who incidentally became The Bachelor, which is a comedic <laughs> bachelor from NBC or whatever, ABC, whatever it's on. <clears throat> I Anyways, did not know him, but I know Eric very and well. And Friedenberg used to tell me all the time, 
hey, you should like listen to my cousin's band. He's got a band. He's got a band. And I was like, yeah, whatever. I don't have time for your cousin. <laughs> and I think I, I'm getting my dates wrong here. But at one point he gave me a cassette tape that was black and like in white out on it or something. It said bleach. And I was like, OK, I got this. Dave Larson, where is that cassette tape? Oh, because no. that wish was like it. the demo. You wish you had it. <laughs> that was like the Nirvana demo or whatever. And, and I loved Eric Freidenberg because he was telling me like there's these bands, there's all these stuff going on. And so I is, feel like are you saying was... that you got into this kind of like oh, punk music and your your transition in was Nirvana, but it was Bleach? Yeah. Or was it like... It the... wasn't Nevermind. You got in with the loud noisy one that people didn't know as much before the yeah. bro before they broke oh yeah that's no, awesome that's and like... and before that you were listening to what kind of music i always listen to a lot of stuff i mean listen i also have a new kids on the block tape somewhere in my life like yeah. it's probably still there because no we're shame. talking about young, young yeah but young. i was like really into i had a friend named i still have a friend named jen ingle and we used to listen to like belbiv devoe and guy and like all that sort of business but then i also was like really into like this loud punk angry thing that was going on and i think just from my background it, and the prepubescence I was experiencing, I love that noise. I love that, like, insane, my parents would yell at me to turn that crap yeah. off, like, I listened. Noise. I listened with headphones because I didn't want to have to repeat, like, the problems my brother had with music my parents didn't like uh, hearing. So I always tried to keep strategic. it. Well, I'd already been through one one sibling having a, a fighting a losing battle, basically. Yeah. And it was, you know, the 70s, you know, there was Satan was yeah. in every song, backwards messages, all that yeah. stuff. And I don't think that stuff really occurred to my parents. They just 80s. thought it sounded like crap, you know. Right. I, look, I think yeah. it's all kind of an excuse just for the parents don't like the music. But so is Bleach the is that tape the first I the think first loud. there were some others. I mean, like at that time, everyone had a band, right? So like yeah. people were always sharing something like kids in school were playing stuff. There were other little bands. And I went to school with some pretty awesome people. I mean, like I went to junior high with Dan Gallucci and like Andrea Zolo and all these amazing musicians who did. They were cool in your stuff. high school. In they your were in my junior high. On your junior high. They were in junior high. And then they were in high school. They went to alternative high school. I think they, you know. They were wiser than I were. <laughs> I think uh, the they went to like, best. It they went was to best. best. I think best. a lot of the people that I'm going to be talking to, if they were involved in the I East love side, a lot of people who went to best. <laughs> I do. People. I do too. Oh, um, and I wasn't from here and I was a yeah. bit older. Okay. We're going to jump ahead. I hate doing this, this fast version of this, okay. but uh, keep looking at the don't clock. Worry. Don't worry. All right. I have it on good authority. You don't have to worry. Oh, very good. Yeah. <laughs> so that you see it doesn't appeal to everybody that way though that's a thing it's only one out of every however many hundred people you know end up becoming real players in like a punk scene or a hardcore scene mm. and the, the 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 music once green day and all that stuff mm -hmm. happened and nirvana and everything happened law we start with Pinhead gun and all that well, I'd, I'd love to but <laughs> I'm I'd, I'd like to start with Operation yeah, Ivy, but hey. <laughs> and Crimp Shrine. But no, but the thing is, though, it, it became much more understandable to the hordes of people. Mm -hmm. Like, I doubt, like in in the early '90s to mid '90s, there were groups of dudes jumping out of cars to beat up punk rockers the yeah. way there were right. ten years before. Sure. But um, even still, like someone like my older brother, who's not that far away from me, who likes aggressive music and likes metal and stuff, still does not have a clue as to why it is i like the kind of music that i like yeah you just miss the honestly completely. dave i try to explain it to people we that moment in the 90s like however whatever you were into if you were into pole jam if you were into mud honey if you were into nirvana whatever it was that you were into it, that was a crazy moment and we were there and we were the right age and it was the right time and it was we caught an amazing opportunity like people like kate, kate becker fought for us in yes. an insane way you know like how i met kate becker was so bonkers in a weird way she, i went to go horseback riding with her like my parents <laughs> are trying to get rid of us and like my dad thinks it's very important that we learn to ride horses in case the revolution comes and he <laughs> wants us to know how to like ride into the sunset by knowing to ride horses that's why oh that's a side like oh yeah so he called the city of redmond he was so like your dad's a prepper my dad has been a prepper ever. He's not so much anymore. Well, he left his country right. during a revolution. Shit happened. Oh, my God. And so he was like, you guys got to get horseback riding lessons. 
Here we go. <laughs> These are claps. These are claps of joy. Uh, your dad rules. So Kate Becker was going to take me and my sister horseback riding. And then something happened and it got canceled. I think we're the only two people who signed up, whatever. And uh, she was just persistent in like calling and being like, hey, let your daughter come hang out. Hey, let, let them come and do this. I'll be responsible for them. I can like do all this stuff. And it opened up all these doors and we had this insane moment where not only were we part of this insane musical thing, but even as teenagers, and I was like 14, 13, whatever it was, we did it. We were the ones doing it. We got empowered like that. Yes. that it was an amazingly huge impact for me. I try and tell Kate this now when I see her. Mm-hmm. And I think she has so many people telling her yeah. this that she's like, OK, already, guys, I get it. Like I gave you guys an opportunity. <laughs> but I don't think I would have had half the sense of entitlement given all the obstacles of growing up in the Pacific Northwest, being a woman of color, like all that sort of stuff, if it weren't for someone like Kate Becker and Mayor Rosemary Ives saying, all right, you do it. What do you guys want to do? It's kind of insane what got set up out there. And I want to say real quick, you mentioned Pearl Jam, you talk about Nirvana and we talk about Green Day, but that was just like a door. That was with a big band. Well, that was just a doorway (laughs) you walk through. That has nothing to do. The idea is that then you, you found that underground burgeoning kind of what's really happening on the edge of things hardcore bands and punk rock bands and things people are doing in garages that it's almost like when you hear it you can tell this is going to be something and maybe it's 10 years later that person's band is nominated for a grammy or they're touring the world or something but you knew no 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 this is this is awesome right now yeah yeah so stuff like pearl jam and green day and, and and nirvana is is just like the doorway that doesn't do justice to really what happened there's no way to explain it how do you tell somebody who wasn't there who didn't live it that you lived a part of what became history like you you were part of something that at a young age everyone thought was kind of nuts didn't get but created a bunch of people who actually really impacted a cultural moment around the world you know and continue to do so like well, now, the funny thing is, is that when you say around the world, you have a different perspective than other people because you saw the impact in another country. Yeah, I'm huge that in we Germany, never... thanks to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, you told me a story um, and we're basically up to up to where we've met at this point mm-hmm. now. So you told me a story about going back to Iran mm-hmm. to see your family. Oh, my God. And and I don't want to say smuggling. I don't want to get you, you in can trouble. Say smuggling. Okay, you yeah. smuggled in. Undertow music, yeah. the band Undertow. Oh, yeah. And gave gave tapes or made tapes for your cousins. Oh, my God. I totally did. I and taught them how to stage dive. Totally. Oh, my God. I did teach them how to stage dive. That is, Amazing. I just want to say right now that oh I don't God. care how many patches someone sews on their damn jacket and oh what tour God. you took in an $800 van and slept on people's couches. If you oh. didn't smuggle illegal <laughs> hardcore into Iran and teach kids how to illegally dance, you are I not as totally cool did. as Matisse. Oh, my God. You know, it used to be, I mean, Iran in the late. 80s early 90s i mean even to this day technically music is illegal in iran um technically it doesn't mean there's not a huge burgeoning music scene there totally is but if they want to give you a hard time they do but at that time there wasn't a burgeoning music scene and i was i would go there for the summer and i spent the whole summer and i wanted music i wanted to listen to something in my walkman you could take your walkman but you know what are you going to listen to so i used to sew the tapes into my suitcase so i would like you know i would hide them and sew them into the lining of the samsonite suitcase because it was like a hard cover and they used to open to look when you went in but they wouldn't like undo the lining and they weren't like running it through the x-ray machine they would they, the way that they do these days you know they would open it and search it by hand and so if you hit it well enough you were all right and i was like i need a summer of undertow like how am i gonna leave here without bikini kill or like the third <laughs> sex or whatever it was that i was you know listening to seaweed and nirvana or whatever and i took those tapes you know and i put them in and i would play them for my cousins and there was no internet at this time so i was it you know and they'd be like what the hell is this you know and i was like this is it i'm part of this thing it's called straight edge and punk and this is what we do we color our hair all crazy colors and like they're like what are you talking they're like how do you dance you know and i was like well everybody gather around just below the bed here and i'm gonna jump and you guys catch me (laughs) you know that's how it's gonna go and actually it's huge because a lot of that time like if you think for a lot of my cousins and their friends especially when they're listening to that kind of music it really does you know there's 
it can be perceived that there's anger in it. And there was at the time, you know, mm -hmm. and when you're living under those conditions or you have those kinds of restrictions, there's a real liberation into hearing somebody else. It's music does connect people, you know, and we thought we were angry as hell and we didn't know why all the time or whatever it was. And I think they didn't necessarily either, although they had some pretty clear ideas, you know, and still do, but it was, a, it was, it be, they became huge. Those tapes went far and wide. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, I, I'm, it's going to be hard for me to find a story. I'm going to like as much of that in the, over the course of doing this podcast. Aww, thanks. And how do you, like you asked, like, how do you describe this to people? Well, I'm going to do about a hundred podcasts <laughs> in, in search of that, of, of that understanding. Um, so, okay. That's, that is a really good story. So we become friends mm -hmm. and one night you blindfolded me and drove me to a restaurant. Do you remember this? Did I take you to Ethiopian food? Yeah. Oh my and God. you said. <laughs> Wait, was Dave Varellen there? Dave Varellen. Oh my God. <laughs> Dave Varellen from Botch, a singer Botch, and I get blindfolded, oh I put in Maddie's vehicle, and driven to an Ethiopian restaurant. I still don't know where this restaurant is. I do think I right might here. have figured it out. Yeah. Right um, and I guess it was because yeah. white people were supposed to know how to get there. And I <laughs> You know what it was? I just really felt like the scene. I mean, come on, Dave. How many people of color were in the entire scene? I think it was like me, Morgan, later. Matsuoka. Matsuoka and... A few people, I don't know. Pause. We have to really rack our brains. Like, those are yeah. the people that really stood out to me. But I was like, how am I going to convince Dave Larson, picky eater, <laughs> and Ben <Bev, laughs> and Dave Varellen, who I did have a big crush on, to go to a flipping Ethiopian restaurant and eat with their hands yeah. like food that like it was a lot so I was like the only way to do it and first also to go to Rainier like a so you, you know, made it so you just made it a game I thought it wasn't we were... a, I thought if I didn't make it exciting you guys were going to talk yourselves out of it and the, <laughs> I still still remember the story you guys the expression when they put the injera bread in front of you was so classic what was the expression it was not pretty. I got to tell you something. That is, I, that was some of the best food I've ever eaten in my life. Awesome. It was so good. And do you, now you were happy with us for one thing. Yes. And you were upset with us for one other thing. <laughs> do you, I would, do you remember what you were happy with us for? You did try it. Oh, I yeah. wanted more. Yeah. Yeah. I've wanted to go there ever since. Awesome. But, um, you told us and we didn't know you said that we passed the eating test. Do you remember that? I don't remember After we this. ate. You said, I just want to let you know, you both passed the eating test. Oh, because you ate with your hands. And also yeah. because you said that we didn't eat like like horrible chewing with our mouths oh, open, oh talking, God. spilling food out. Like, Thank God. I would have left. Right. So that's nice because we didn't know there was an eating test. Yeah. We upset you when we referred to the bread as the pancake. <laughs> a little sensitive. Why does it to say injera? <laughs> I don't know that word to this day. Let me tell I you remember, something. I remember was, I got upset with you about something. Fantastic could... pancake. <laughs> it's your bread. It's made with tough flour and soda, and it's really hard to make. It was so good, and every single bite of everything that I could not identify that was on that plate that went in that bread was phenomenal. Spice. Awesome. I mean, I, I love that kind of food. It's, so I still love Ethiopian food. Yeah, it's, the, it's literally the only time I've ever gone to. Ethiopian food. Yeah. And I mean, I grew up in a place where, remember, where like all of us ate. I think it cost $20 total and we didn't want to eat again for like three years. They brought us. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, you know, kind of looked at us like, whoa, what are you doing what here? What the hell? Are yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, I, but I grew up in a place where you'd be like, oh, yeah, Ethiopian food. And someone would be like, what's that? Sand on a plate? <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> 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 so it was it was a great experience. Yeah. And I, I did kind of feel like, well, I can't repeat this. And then there was a little bit like, well, I'm not supposed to go there alone. Maybe I'm not welcome. I think at that time in Seattle, you may not have been because <laughs> like, I really, I think they allowed us because I was like, all right, I'm Iranian. I'm coming here. You guys are refugees. I'm a refugee. Let's just make it happen. Can I get some Ajira? Dave? Yeah. Matt, is Maddie here? <gasps> Yay! Yay! Oh, oh look what happened. Sorry. 
Okay. Oh. Recording already? We are, but I'm so excited oh. to see you. I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. Yay. Come and interrupt. Okay. Hi. So this oh, is so good to see you. Yay. The second my time favorite. in my young podcast career. Let's enter the indebted part Miss, of the first. Miss, <laughs> Miss Michael Ann has now barged in, yeah, well, and she did not know Maddie was in here. The house, uh, you know, on an evening <laughs> after I work, and tell me that you're going to be starting way earlier than you started. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I did not think I'd be interrupting. I'm sorry. No. Oh, it's no. th actually, you know what? This can bring us to a story that's kind of about this point in the proceedings. I really? think this will work out. Uh -oh, what story? So I, Michael Ann owns this home that I'm podcasting out of. We've been together for 20 years this year. Talked about this before on here. Not yet. Several months Coming. away. Why are we together? How did this happen? <clears throat> How did we meet? <clears throat> oh, someone's clearing their throat <clears throat> at the sorry, microphone. Sorry, something's in my throat. That would be your at fault. Least. It's the sound of "I told you so." <laughs> <laughs> now, now I told you that I wanted to meet Michael Ann, and I had mm -hmm. made some failed attempts <laughs> at meeting Michael Ann. Yes, yeah. Lloyd Dobler. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Lloyd I, Dobler, indeed. I, like I talked about in the Rocky episode, <laughs> I dressed as Lloyd Dobler for a Halloween party. I thought she'd be at, and she wasn't there. <laughs> um. And because I had seen I Michael Ann at the old firehouse. Oh, yeah. you remember that? I do remember. <laughs> and Rocky was yeah. wearing the silver outfit yeah, for Stay Right 522. Yeah. <laughs> so, so sad I missed that. <laughs> I had saw Michael Ann at the old firehouse with some of her friends. You mm -hmm. already brought up Eric, Fre Eric Freidenberg. Yeah. Um, he was there. She was probably there with his girlfriend, Michelle. Yeah. And they were playing My pool. My besties at the time. And they were laughing Michelle about Jacobson? some joke. No, Michelle, uh, Michelle Brady at right. the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I fell for you because of, because of your laugh across the room. Yes, and thought, oh, geez, who's that girl? I don't blame you. Yeah. Started asking around, asked Jake Snyder about her. That that part that went over well. That no, well, it did, but that'll go. That'll come up when I get Jake in that seat about what that conversation Jake was. Jake didn't talk about my laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys hear that? That's still an amazing laugh. Come on, yeah, it's, it's good. Um, and I mentioned mm -hmm. to you yes. that I needed a way to meet my clan. Mm -hmm. And tell me, what did you come up with? You know what? Can I not tell you exactly what I came up with? Because my memory isn't perfect. But uh, I, did, uh, I so remember the feeling because I don't get it that often. <laughs> but the minute he said to me, there's this girl. I know this is kind of weird. First of all, Dave Larson asking me about a girl was the equivalent <laughs> of like, I don't even have a comparison. You know, like you just you never asked me about girls. You know, like you're always like, this is what's going on in the scene. We got to sell all these <laughs> records. I got a closet full of this crap. Screw this band. Like whatever it was. <laughs> so suddenly Dave Larson's like very seriously like, I need to talk to you about this girl, you know? And I was like, who? Like, who's it going to be? And I had this like Rolodex of people going through my head of like, <laughs> who could possibly like get your attention? And when you said Michael Ann, I had this insane <laughs> feeling, which I have not had. It happened like once before when I introduced somebody else where I was like, ah. I was like, that's it. That is your partner. Like, uh, I don't know what to you say were right. or do. I was right. Mm -hmm. But let's. But I don't remember what I okay, did. Okay, so you called me up and said I have a plan. Uh -huh. There's a show at the old firehouse. Right. Michael Ann wanted me to come pick her up and take her to the show. She didn't have a ride That's to the right. show. Yeah, I didn't have a car yet. And your plan yeah. was this: you were going to give me Michael Ann's address, call her, and say I can't come get you. I sent my friend Dave to get you, and oh, I was just going to show up having never met her. And she's going to come to the door and supposedly come to the show with me. Yeah. At which point I said, hell no. Unfortunately. I will not no, do best that. best call ever. Best call ever. I would so <laughs> not have probably gotten in the car. Probably not. If but I, I, did, I do think that was an excellent idea. So this <laughs> well, it was, I like that you were thinking. <laughs> I was. And look, the die was cast at that point. And in point. fact, there I was think no... she actually tried to set it up even though you'd already said, hell no. Yeah, I did. And I was like, I hell did. no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so there was... There I was... do. Uh, she's, she's right. Because I remember she was like, you want me to get in a car... <laughs> With some dude. <laughs> I don't know. And, and I only good. kind of vaguely knew who he was from people like Matt Matsuoka, and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah, so th that wasn't going to work. No. Okay, but what ended up happening was you still said, well, we're going to make plans to go out to coffee after the show. Right. <laughs> and that was it? Mm -hmm. Like that. Yeah. Come on. So you came, you picked me up. We got to we sit across out. the seat from each other, or what across was the table from each other. What called? It was Downtown Hotel Redmond. Cafe. Hotel Cafe. Oh, was it the Hotel Cafe the that Hotel night? Cafe. It's yeah. like a Vietnamese restaurant. And I came there with another boy that night. Yeah, we got mm -hmm. rid of him. We did, very <laughs> shortly thereafter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so the next day, Red Rocket were playing in the U District. Uh -huh. yep. I went to that show. It was in a record store. All those guys were there. 
Oh, yeah, Your apartment was in the U District. Yeah. Um, you were like, come over, because we had met each other yeah, now. So just up the street, yeah. And one week later, we went on a date, and you claimed the Red Rocket Day as our, our yeah. anniversary, and I claimed the no, date no, day the as day, the anniversary. No, the day before, the first night at the Hotel Cafe. I Hotel knew. Cafe should be your anniversary. Yeah, it is. Only but, so I can be involved. Just because it's, it's that's December our first 2nd. words with each other. That's the first words with each other, but we went yeah, on a but I date. Knew. Yeah, but we I went knew. on a I date. Knew I, wasn't, yeah. I knew I, did, I didn't go home with that boy that night. So. Well, okay, that's nice. And I'd I'm, like to say I had something to do with that as well. Yeah. Because oh. <laughs> there was, what, like five or six of us at the table. Yeah. It yeah. wasn't like it was just you and me and this other yeah. random boy and right. Maddie. <laughs> it was, no, Look, I know was, there were other people there, but I only yeah. remember you. Exactly. Uh, that's good the answer. Point. And no that there is 20 years yeah. of commitment, right? Yeah. That's why. Yeah. yeah. I see. <laughs> if it wasn't for this friendship being first, you would never you have go. met me. Ever, ever. Oh, yeah. That's true. Yeah. So you will always and forever be in our lives. <sighs> it's good to be right. Oh. Oh. All right. All right. We're I'm running out you, of time and I want to get to. Yeah. Oh, you are? Okay. I'm, I'm going to leave you guys here and let you guys finish up your. Well, I'm going to yeah. say that, that your um, interruptions have worked out great so far. Yeah. We're Every still going to have to rig yeah. some kind of lighting thing on the door or something. So, you know, yeah, we need one of those on, on air. air. On <laughs> air. Put it like outside on the front of the house so that before I ever drive up and make the dog. <laughs> Maybe you could make. Yeah. You yeah. could treat, te teach Winston to be a guard dog for the <laughs> <recording>. <laughs> <laughs> we can't teach him anything. No, <laughs> no we really can't. All right. Okay. Well, finish, thank you, finish. babe. I, I'm glad we got to tell that story. Huh? Bye, Michael. Bye, guys. Yeah, all right. Back to business. Back to business. I love that girl. So Honestly, I. Dave, you really lucked out. She's flipping amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Life's lottery. It is life's lottery. I yeah. Love her. At one point, I had an opportunity. She liked to that work... too. Just for the record. Well, okay, but yeah. let's no. It's pretty much me. I'm pretty much the winner. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of things I've missed uh, out on, and I just try to make I'll keep keep myself centered by thinking that you know some things did work out. Fair enough. <laughs> okay, so and then I asked you to be in the Edge of Quarrel. I asked you to play the big role for a female character. Can we say something right before? Yeah. If I remember correctly, you were writing Edge of Quarrel, and you were telling me about this. Right. Sure, because I wrote and it for a long time. You wrote it for a really long time. You were working on the script for a very long time, and you didn't have a female, a prolific female person in the script for a while. And when you were telling, when you were talking about it, it was always these bands. It was always this thing. And I think that, and this was the Riot Girl at the time and me speaking, <laughs> that I really pushed you to be like, you have to have a woman. You have to really make it be like, this isn't just about men in the oh. scene. I don't know if you remember this. I, I remember it very clearly at one point and we had like this weird tiff about it and then you were like weird tiff. no it wasn't a tiff we had a we had a, a discussion about it. about it and i was like you so it's probably like well then it's gonna be you then something like that and i was like <laughs> but i wasn't trying to say it should be me i just was just saying it should be someone that sounds really so i was really self-conscious that you would think that i was trying to jockey for a role although let's not kid around like i totally want to be part of that well i was i think i was still surprised when you I was surprised when you were willing to do it. I was surprised mm -hmm. at how good you were at it. Oh, I was surprised at the level of professionalism <laughs> and effort that you brought to the whole project. Like, thanks, there Dave. were few people that were as Johnny on the spot about it as you were. Oh, thank you. Janie on the spot. Janie. Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> Some riot girl thing. No. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, that, that it doesn't it doesn't come together without you. And that's and look, so so also that means it's partly your fault. True. But okay. what? <laughs> Listen. Yeah. I also think it's really a beautiful thing that I was like the first woman to be part of that film. And also that I get to be the first woman on the show. Oh. I that... think like life has an interesting way of going in the circles. Oh, that yeah. It, it, yeah. Maybe that does mean something. <laughs> okay. I'm taking it. I'm open to such things. I like that kind of serendipity in life, so I'm taking it. Very cool. Well, and just... I loved, loved being part of Edge of Coral. It is something that I will confess to you at times. I've been like, oh, my God, I work at the United Nations. It shows up in Google. What do I do? Um, or like, how do I answer when clients are Googling me and it comes up and they're like, are you Matthews Keshavars in this movie? Like, are you an actress? <laughs> it's, oh, and I've heard so that, many stories from so many people, but none so, of them are like this. But I hear, I mean, amazing things have happened to me from being part of that film you know no, in spite of well, first of all <laughs> i love loved being part of it because i think i think that there was so much that happened and you'll recall there were certain people that kind of seattle became so popular 
that um, there it became so popular that a lot of people started moving here from other places. And it, they weren't people who really understood the moment in the same way those of us who'd grown up here or who had those frustrations about growing up in this damp, dark, yeah, kind of amazing artistic town. And they came here and I used to always say, oh, these are all these people that come here to heal. They're like broken people that have come here to heal. And a lot of them caused a lot of divisions in the scene, you know, and it was a really painful time. And I think that that moment really influenced a lot of your writing yes. on Edge of Coral. And it's very telling kind of some of what was happening there. And for me, I was graduating college and I knew I didn't want to stay in Seattle. I had these aspirations of doing international work and kind of kind of implying what I had dedicated my life to learning about or whatever whatever um <laughs> and uh and that was like the summer like our last hurrah for me it was kind of a last hurrah where i was like all right i'm gonna do this i'm not gonna get a job really i'm gonna like be part of this film i want dave to succeed at doing it i knew it was gonna be historic because i knew that <laughs> that moment of seattle grunge and punk rock and all that sort of stuff wasn't was evolving i'm not gonna say it was ending but it was changing you know, Kurt died, like all this other stuff happened, you know, P P Green, H Green Day became huge. They weren't going to play our house shows anymore. You know, like all these little things were happening where we would have maybe called them sellouts at the time. In retrospect, they were, you know, securing their futures. Um, <laughs> good on you. Um, but I really wanted to be a part of it. And it was it was truly a summer of like teamwork and partnership and love amongst this scene and this community that we created. And I love it. I it loved it. Now, when, when did you leave? I left, I moved to New York January 29th to no, 1999, January 29th, 1999. Okay. So the movie wasn't even finished for almost no, a year. It wasn't, but the filming had been done. I was mm -hmm. all just about to go into the editing stage. Yes. So there may have even been, did you ever have to come to my apartment and do lines in the, in yes. the microphone into the, I did. in front of the TV? So yep. was that after you left or were you back I to came see family? Back, I came back to see <clears throat> family once i think it was like a year i was gone that first time for a really long time and i came back i think i, I want to say september yeah was the was first time i came good. back and i needed audio bad probably yeah you did it was a thing <laughs> <laughs> and then i came back for one of the premieres oh awesome i remember you did, what i wore you were just happened to be back you no i come, came back for it you came back for yeah. it yeah okay, i I'm, wasn't gonna miss that i'm definitely four hours <laughs> And you were so sensitive about anybody suggesting you edit it more. No, no, no. It's two hours long. It's two hours long, not four yeah, hours long. I felt like it was four hours. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's, that's, <laughs> yes. Look, it's, yeah. It's, it's not, okay. I'm going to be talking about this movie a lot. And it's not that the movie is worth talking about that it much. Is, it's actually. that we all worked on it together and it was part of our collective. It's uh, not just that. I don't undermine your film. Like, I understand you probably have criticisms of it. I understand you're like, sure you know, I do. all those sorts of things. But truly, it captured something that for those of us who grew up here, that were part of that moment in history. And it took a long time to really realize that that was a historic time to be in Seattle. Like, look at all that's happened. It's been 25 years since that moment that your film is one of the only documentations of the people of the mood of the act actions and things and like some of it is like a metaphor because if you weren't part of it you like okay it's a movie and like you'll have an opinion of it one way or another but i still i mean i got recognized for that film on the streets of new york and on the subway like stuff still happens to me rocky, just rocky a year got ago. recognized in spain yeah i'm telling you i'm huge in germany like why is this hard to believe like <laughs> ich liebe dich deutschland <laughs> All right, so let's talk about real accomplishments that people have in their life mm -hmm. in this room. Let's talk about you leaving Seattle and going to New York and the things you've done since. Yeah. What have you done <laughs> with your life? I left New York. I'm sorry, I left Seattle and I moved to New York in 1999. And I went to work for a project that was with the UN. And I lucked out. You know, I didn't luck out. I worked hard. I will be honest. You I created didn't luck. luck. Out. I created luck for myself. And I suffered and fought tooth and nail because I don't come from a family where my last name gets me through the doors. And I've built a career for myself out of it and working in human rights and social justice related causes. Do you still work in conjunction with the UN? I do. They're a client now. They're instead of my employer. So you're like a, a, a private contractor. Mm -hmm. What I services a, do you provide? 
I run a PR firm that I've run now for seven years about, and it's called The Make Agency. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a play off my name. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the Matty's ketchup jars that we began with. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, I run this firm and I, I consult people on arts, politics and culture and with a special emphasis on human rights, I represent the underdog. So I have represented in the post 9-11 climate, literally at one point, all of the uh, Guantanamo detainees and uh, detainees at Af Af uh, Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan. And uh, any... who contacted you? Is that something you put yourself into, or were you contacted by someone that I they worked, needed representation? I worked for another firm, and while I was there, they, we represented an organization called the Center for Constitutional Rights. Mm -hmm. And the Center for Constitutional Rights uh, specialized in the death penalty kind of related cases. So after 9 11, and I was in New York for that, uh, after cool. 9 11, those attorneys were the only ones that were interested in what was happening in terms of all these people being rendered to an island known as Guantanamo, which is right. next to Cuba. Well, not separate island, same island. And uh, they had experience because Haitian refugees had been sent there because of their HIV status uh, in the early 90s, and they had represented them. Haitian refugees had been sent to Guantanamo Bay. Yes, and because they were the same trying to come to the, the United States, and they were HIV positive, and it was the middle of the AIDS scare. Oh. And so they'd sent a lot of people there. Okay. And so, the so they essentially already knew the channels. They knew the channels and they had experience doing death penalty work and they were like, wait a minute, you can't render and send these people there. It's against the constitution. You're breaking international law, la, 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 la. And only death penalty attorneys were willing to take on some of these cases. And I was, now, when you say death penalty attorneys, you mean people are trying to fight against the death, death penalty. penalty attorneys that represented death penalty cases and were doing anti-death penalty right. work. Um, so they were very familiar with representing the least popular people uh, in okay. society. And they were they gathered there through the Center for Constitutional Rights and were looking at ways to do you know address the legal concerns of sending these individuals. Now, at first, if I remember correctly, it wasn't even necessarily Guantanamo Bay. It was just people being arrested, and no one knew where they were. No one knew where they were, but they, we knew that they were going to Guantanamo. And these weren't. Now, at first, wasn't it? Totally correct me if I'm mm -hmm. wrong, but I remember you telling me like one time when you were back right after this stuff went down and everything was crazy, that it wasn't like battlefield people from Afghanistan that had been sent there, but it was, um, there were people that had been arrested here in the U S under mistaken identity yeah, or they were like no people. fly list people stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and, and a lot of your initial involvement was just trying to get them connected with their families. Right. And a number of those people never did anything wrong and were free. Uh, and uh, just for, I mean, history has shown that a number of those people were released without charge or were released without, you know, so let's, so let's be clear about this. How long imprisoned, with no charges and no contact with family member. For those Guantanamo detainees? No, for the, the ones we're talking about, like in the U.S. That didn't go in to the Guantanamo. US? They weren't, that weren't battlefield. That were people that were in the U.S. that were then People, detained. I think one of the most prominent cases is Maher Arar, who's a Canadian citizen who was returning from Jordan and had a layover. He was returning from Jordan, go to back to, uh, I'm sorry, from Syria. And he was going to his home in Toronto and he had a layover in JFK. He was mm -hmm. arrested. He wasn't sent to Guantanamo. He was sent back to Syria and oh. uh, through after, after going through private sites. And he suffered immensely. And I think, I believe it's been a while. And I'm sorry that I don't remember the exact. I think he was in, he was for a year. But in the end, no charges. He'd never done anything wrong. No, he never did. He's in fact sued the Canadian government who's issued a formal apology and recognition. But if you look at the number of cases that are still in Guantanamo and the individuals that are just, I mean, this past week, you know, uh, they repatriated, as they say, a lot of people to Uruguay. Mm -hmm. Those individuals were not officially convicted of doing anything. Wrong. Right. When they, when and that's been 13 some years. <clears throat> and there's been a lot of, I know there's a lot of people who are very opposed to letting any of these guys out of Guantanamo Listen, Bay. I took these cases on, I was, you know, doing this human rights work and I only agreed to do these kinds of cases. I think it also kind of happened to me because they're like, Hey, you're Middle Eastern, you're Muslim, you speak the <laughs> language, jump on board, you know? And uh, and I wanted to do it, not because of any like, you know, grandiose sense of you know self. But I was like, I don't know what happened to these guys, but I'm Muslim and I really don't like what's going on over here. And I feel a sense of obligation to my community um, to figure out what's happening. And I also happen to believe in the rule of law. So I right. don't believe in execution executions for anybody for anything, you know, right, but first of all, I also don't believe in war and all that kind of business, you know, but you have to charge somebody. You can't and, and convict kidnap somebody. Them eventually, you cannot kidnap somebody from their home in 
Pakistan where there was no war and they're sitting with their two children at dinner time or they're falling they're you know sleep and you can't then put them on a plane blindfolded and gallivant them around the country to secret places without them having any contact to an attorney any idea of the charges against them or any idea of what you know they've done wrong and then keep them in a prison and under inhumane conditions and abuse them and violate international law and not ever tell them why or give them due process. That's just not what right. you, you, can't you can do, do that. it if you're a we can dictator say, state and you want to be in violation of every, you know. Right. And we can say morally you can't do that, but you can do that because that was what you, was done and has been done. It, it's still in the courts whether or not you can do that. The fact yeah, is what's going to happen retroactively. Do that. I'd love to you see know? something happen. I'd love to see somewhere, somewhere. So, some authority come down and say this was wrong and someone has to account for sure. it maybe one day they will and you know this whole idea of we had to do what we had to do because of the situation you know like and 24 Look was on tv did. at the time and that yeah. was used for a lot of like the uh, justification for torture mm -hmm. which is a a connected a connected issue. I mean, some of that you torture had to do with- You can look at that moment in history and look at the ramifications of that moment in history. Yeah. You set the precedent that you could treat people like that. And you did it and you made people what they call the other. Yeah. You demonized and made people completely inhuman to the rest of us. And just because they're a bad person and they must be bad and look who they're- And the subtext to that, and some of them were. I'm not trying to make excuses. Of some of course. them are bad guys, however we want to put it. Yeah, they did yeah. shitty things. They're yeah. shitty people. Whatever you want to call it. Fine. Yeah. But the point is that we're human beings and we have to rise above the inhuman acts or beliefs of other people and not treat a group of them like they're all the same. Right. And what they did is they took a group of people and took away justice and law, and then they set a precedent, and that precedent has resulted in the foreign policy that we suffer through now. Right. And all the crappy things that are happening in the world now, and every time you bring it up and you're like, but you can't behead people, and you can't kidnap and do all these things to American citizens, and the response is, yeah, but you've been water waterboarding us for 13 years. Right. And And look... I don't like either of them, but you, we can't say waterboarding and beheading are the same thing, obviously. Obviously not. <laughs> but I, what I'm saying is that when you start, it creates and perpetuates a cycle of violence. Sure. And a lack of compassion towards one another. And it just, it, it, it's terrible. Yes. You know, and, and, and the alliances. I mean, I'm, I'm, yes, of course you can't compare waterboarding no, and but, beheading. But every but, waterboarding instance that occurred should be prosecuted under war crimes. Like yes. that's, I, because we did. Mm-hmm. And our government <laughs> prosecuted other people for waterboarding our mm -hmm. soldiers, and then we did it. So guess what, guys? <laughs> good for the goose, good for it's the gander. Not, yeah. It's That's, not pretty. And I don't get into a lot of this stuff in this podcast, it's probably but it's not what you do, and it's interesting. Like... No, it's interesting, and I'm not going to go too much into politics on this show. But... <laughs> it's probably better for everyone who's listening. No, it's good for everybody, but this is so so interesting. So, <laughs> you know, we'll, we're going to swerve back out of that territory. I started working in human rights. How's that? You start working in human rights, yeah. and it's so interesting. But see, that's the thing, though. Punk rock, I mean, look at the lyrics of a lot of these bands, of uh, you know, the political lyrics, like, you know. You went and did something in the world about the kinds of beliefs that were being talked about Thanks, in that Dave. world. And so that's imp very impressive to me. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I will say, though, that historically, a lot of my friends in the scene, as they say, we've never lost contact. We maybe didn't talk so much or whatever, but I feel still feel like it's a community, you know, and I've come yeah. back to folks at different points. And I've been like, can you help these guys out? Can you do this? Or can we like, you know, do stuff? One interesting example just for the purpose of this podcast is that i uh there's a band called uh there was a movie called heavy metal in baghdad which featured a baghdadi band like a metal band yeah and they were coming to the u.s and in various instances like i'm just saying little moments and things but they were coming to the u.s they were moving to new york um, after having to flee iraq they were featured in a vice film and vice contacted me and they were like these guys are coming what do we do you know and it i wouldn't have been able to help them i think in the way that i did just because if i had just been another human rights activist or whatever i got the scene i got the music stuff and it was through those things like i helped get them jobs i helped them get this you know established and at various points i've gotten myself in a bunch of pickles with a lot of like <laughs> middle eastern bands seeking asylum who've like ended up living on my couch for three months not because they were my friends or i believed in human rights for them necessarily i mean they obviously did but because i was like i have this punk rock diy background and ethic 
And that built me into who I am. So I got to stay true to it. I still got to help these guys. You know, I still, it still is part of who I am. And it's that moment we were talking about, that you know, phenomenal. So what kind of stuff are you working on now currently? Is there any of that you can talk about? Uh, some of it I do talk about. One of the big victories has been the um, Afghan uh, Bagram Air Force Base and uh, the release of some of the prisoners that are there. It's a victory in that they were released just before we're going to the Supreme Court. Um, the, now, is that it? Is I, I don't know if people know about that. Is that just like another Guantanamo it's Bay? It's like another Guantanamo Bay. They decided to prison close at prison the Air Force in Base. December. Yeah. Bagram prison. Yeah. Hmm. That doesn't and, really make its way into our presidential no, politics here. No, so people don't bother. know much about no. it. But I've been working on that case pro bono for geez, a long time, at least seven years, maybe longer. Um, and so that's a small victory in terms of their being released. It's not so much of a victory because it's unclear where they've been repatriated to and all that sort of stuff. Wow. But, you know, you, there's I chose to go into PR as opposed to like going to diplomacy because I realized that I could kind of see a beginning and end to a lot of cases and projects. And so um, that's kind of it's very rewarding for me. I am also producing uh, a lot more. I'm producing a uh, TV show for a major network uh, that uh, is focused on music. And you all guys, are, I can't talk about more than that. Oh, but I, well, can you talk to me privately about I it? I can talk to you privately about it, but I've signed an NDA, so I cannot talk okay. about, like okay. specifics. But you, everyone will get to hear and see about it, which I'm super excited. And again, that's something that my punk rock roots lends credibility to me for um, Google me comes up, edge of coral comes up. I'm from you. I am of you. You can like, you know, <laughs> like, trust me. I mean, I understand the music scene and that's been really great and super rewarding. And I continue to do a lot of the human rights work. A lot of the stuff that you see, I did a lot around Ferguson. Um, I represent, uh, some of the people that are on the ground, uh, there in Ferguson this past summer and, you know, leading up to that, I do a lot of the police brutality stuff and kind of domestically in the U S and almost any and everything that relates to the Middle East um, comes through my desk in one way or another. I don't get to talk about a lot of it publicly. but So I feel this way about Greg Bennett, too. And mm -hmm. Greg and I did not talk extensively about the work that he's done. Mm -hmm. We talked about a lot of the fun Greg stuff. Greg and, and I talk a lot of, sometimes about <laughs> extensively. <laughs> but Bennett and I talked some, about some stuff. But And this is the way I feel about Bennett. And this is the way I feel about you is that I'm I'm impressed by what you do because I know that it wouldn't take much time in that world to crush me mm -hmm. emotionally. Yeah. Um, I don't think I have, I, I only really operate well in a, and all the way back from when we met, you know, mm -hmm. in a, here's what we can do. Let's build something. Let's do something exciting mm -hmm. and have fun and be friends. Mm -hmm. And I don't, once you start getting into dark places, it's like, yeah. even if you, are crucial and you work hard to, to make a dent in these horrible things that are happening around the world. It's, it feels like, do you ever get a sense of having a victory or, or you do sometimes, are you, are you okay with just being the dent? You know what's strange. I have, I I'm Facebook friends with a lot of former detainees of Guantanamo or um, people who have gone through some adversity that I've helped, you know, and I remember, there are moments that you just feel like, holy cow, I actually just did something. I remember the day Bush got elected um, and I was in Washington, D.C. protesting <laughs> and it was so cold and it was such a horrible day. And I had seen this amazing moment where the new Black Panther Party had come down screaming at the pigs and like all this amazing stuff. You're like, wow, like you're doing all this stuff and all these people are out here and like, what's our future going to be? And we failed, you know, because this election stolen and all that stuff that you feel. And I got a phone call from a client who was crying hysterically saying that her brother-in-law's death sentence had been commuted. And in that terrible sadness and whatever, you're kind of like, wow, I just did something. You know, I'd placed these op-eds, we'd done all this stuff. And like, they chose this case, like, you know, to commute, Clinton commuted this death sentence. How could that, you know, be? And you have moments like that. And sometimes you see these Gitmo detainees who post pictures with their families or they get married or they have a, a positive life milestone or they're writing something and you feel like, all right, you know, like these people are back with their families, you know, and it is a dark job at times. Like I, it's not a super bright job, you know, and I, it took me a really long time to figure out how you sparse out like the dark stuff without becoming a dark person um, and without 
kind of wrecking your personal relationships, you know, whether they be romantic or friends or whatever, because you bring your, your work home. You know, you well, saw when I walked into your house today, the conversation I was having on on the phone, you know, like. But you still have a fire and energy and exuberance that you bring. I love people. Right. I love humanity. I really believe human. It's so corny. I'm super corny. So in this, this way. has not crushed you. It has not darkened you. Some days, but not everyone most has days. a dark day. Some days you kind of like you really like some things really, really hurt your soul. Like James Foley being beheaded really, really hurt my soul. You know, he's a friend of many friends. And you're kind of like, how can this be? You know, I look at what's happening in Syria on the borders and you're like, how how do you tell people Gaza crushes me when that stuff happens? Because you can only argue with people so far and some things are not complicated. Human rights is not complicated. Right. It's black and white. Don't treat people like that. Period. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you come from. I don't care where they're from. I don't care what religion they believe in. There is a path to peace and there is a path to a harmonious living. It's not a utopia. Humanity's ugly. Living is ugly. Relationships are ugly. Life is ugly. You know, it's hard. But, you know, you can start somewhere. Yeah. And I started with Seattle Punk Rock. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I um, appreciate you. And I'm, I'm very proud whenever I see your name come up oh, or see you involved in something. Thanks, um, Dave Larson. It's, yeah, so we don't get to see each other nearly as nearly enough anymore. But uh, but we're memorialized in this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be friends forever. 20 years and running. Yes, absolutely. So thank you for coming out. Can I still get invited for a fish dinner one of these days? Oh, yeah. Learn do you how still go to fishing? Do that again. I haven't been able to catch a fish in a long time. <laughs> I'm a little afraid of the fish. I think it's all, I think it's all poison now. Yeah, but it's not Fukushima poisoned. You can go to the river. I, I think up here we are Fukushima yeah, poisoned. Yeah, kind of are Fukushima. I don't know. That's for I the mean, conspiracy podcast. That's for the podcast conspiracy podcast. That we Sign me up. I that, have information. Well, we haven't started it yet. Oh, well, that'll be great if you could I'd be it. an excellent person on the conspiracy. <laughs> you go to my client base. <laughs> I will, I'll make you first Sunday. Awesome. Please do. Thank you so much for coming out. Love you, Dave Larson. Love you, too. Woo All right. I really wish I had had an opportunity to have more time with Matisse for this episode, but time constraints being what they are, this is a slightly shorter episode than than what I've done so far. But um, you know, she has been such a positive influence in my life and in the lives of so many people, um, and I, I feel like that came through. Um, you know, I'm just thrilled that I had the opportunity to catch her while she was in town and uh, get you know get her on tape. Um, as far as corrections go in this episode, I think the only thing really that I had, listening back to it, the only thing to correct is when I uh, stupidly said that Oklahoma wasn't part of the South or that I didn't really think of it as being part of the South. And, and look, when I look on a map, which I did, um, it, yeah, Oklahoma is uh, much more Southern than it was in my memory of the, the layout of the United States. Uh, but... I just still think of it as more of a Midwest kind of cowboy state more than I think of it as some kind of deep South Confederate state. I realize maybe from four-year-old Matisse's point of view, uh, there wasn't much of a difference. Um, but, you know. So anyway, that's just me being fairly ignorant of the uh, map of my own country, which isn't uh, terribly surprising. Anyway, so that's basically it. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, rate us and review us on iTunes, please. And uh, follow our Twitter account at Nosy Nobody. And see you shortly with another episode. This podcast is a product of the Nobody's Knows Podcast Network. Executive producers David R. Larson and K. Drake Streetman. Music for this episode provided by Polymorph from the record Artifacts, Demos, and Debris.